Hello, and welcome to Why Not Change the World, the RPI podcast. My name is Jeannie Hedden Gallagher. On February 18, 2021, NASA's Perseverance rover made its historic landing on Mars. In Troy, New York, Karen Rogers, the director of the Rensselaer Astrobiology Research and Education, or RARE, Center, was hosting a watch party with several other prominent scientists and engineers. In this special episode of the podcast, we're going to drop in on that event to learn more about what it takes to get to Mars. Among the party participants was Kobe Boykins, a 1996 graduate of Rensselaer. Boykins is now a senior mechanical engineer working on rovers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He called in from California. So I started off, uh, you know, like a lot of students do at RPI. I, I actually grew up in Nebraska, and so I got the Rensselaer Medal uh, in high school, and that was sort of a start to me going, "What? What is this place, RPI?" And um, I looked into the school, and, and they had a Division One hockey program, and I, I walked onto the hockey team. So not only was I um, uh, in the engineering world, I actually played ice hockey there uh, at, RP, at RPI. Um, and when I was there, one of the things I always wanted to do, and, and they, they, we really talked about a lot, was the cooperative education program. And so I had put my resume in and, and sort of said, hey, I would like to work at uh, NASA. And, and I know at the time we had a pretty good relationship with JPL. I had done some of the, uh, when, we, when we had on lab or on, on, on school site uh, interfaces, that JPL would show up and I went and talk to them. Uh, and then in my, my, I think it was my sophomore year, in, 2000, well, well, geez, I can't remember. My, my, end of my sophomore year, middle of my sophomore year, junior year, somewhere. Gosh, it's all, you know, blur today. Um, I got a phone call from uh, a guy named Don Bickler at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And Don Bickler is the father of the mobility system that you see on all of our rovers. So happened, started off in Sojourner and has been used throughout all of the rovers that we have. Uh, and he, he asked me some questions, asked me some technical questions. We did a technical interview why we were on the phone. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this guy is going to figure out I'm a total phony and I don't know anything. Uh, and then the next day I get this phone call that says, hey, um, uh, why don't you come out to uh, JPL and work with us? And um, so I packed up my stuff. I drove from uh, RPI in Troy and, and ended up in Southern California here in Pasadena and uh, started to work on the first rover that we sent to the surface of Mars, which was called Sojourner. And uh, my job as a student was to actually, we did two different things. One was I made all the cleats, so the wheels had these cleats on them. And, uh, you know, it was sort of cheap labor. Um, that was one of my jobs. The other job, which is actually quite a bit more fun, was we didn't actually understand uh, exactly how this multi-body system was going to work. So in that video, you saw uh, a parachute and the main body of the vehicle uh, and for, uh, for uh, Sojourner and then on to Spirit and Opportunity, we actually had an airbag system that was held by a string and not a descent stage uh, that you saw here, a sky crane maneuver um, for what we're doing for Curiosity and then now uh, for Perseverance, which you're going to see today. Uh, so uh, anyway, we built that, we built that, a mock-up of that, and then we, we flew it off of a helicopter in Ohio to actually get sort of feedback on those dynamics. Either way, um, you know, I came back, I graduated, uh, you know, with, I'll, I should tell a quick story. One of my, my one of my funniest classes was I came back and I had one of my you know core uh, mechanisms courses uh, and and you know I had learned how to do mechanism analysis now being at JPL and so when I did it the way we would normally do it it wasn't correct right I, I wasn't worried about the third decimal place getting the answer right I was just worried about getting close enough and saying okay with the factor safety two we're good and that really made my teacher mad uh, professor. So, it, but, you know, I think it was such a great experience that I learned how I learned a lot of the uh, what is the practical engineering, what we're learning in hands-on engineering uh, at RPI, and then how to actually apply that to what we do at JPL. And then one of the things that I really love about the, the laboratory as it's set up is it, it feels very much like uh, campus uh, and not very different from RPI other than um, uh, it's on a different hill in a lot warmer climate, uh, and I don't ever have to worry about walking through the snow. I do have to worry about earthquakes. Um, but, uh, you know, we can, we, we, we're always learning and it, it's a challenge and, and that I know that on our crest it says knowledge and thoroughness, but uh, it, it, it's so interesting to me um, is that one of the things that we always look for is people to be very knowledgeable and be very, very thorough. We use the engineering acumen and diligence uh, when you're doing a job like this. And, and so um, as, you, as you can see the background and the, some of the questions that are coming through, that the engineering that goes into one of these vehicles, and we've talked a lot about the science today, 
uh, so far, but the engineering to just make this vehicle uh, be able to land uh, successfully, get to the surface and land in Jezero Crater where we want it to go, uh, how we operate it uh, in, in, you know, in, in this remote environment, um, the software that's on board to uh, communicate to it um, and have it do, I'm going to say, some smarts, like almost an ant. Those types of things are uh, amazingly developed and then tested. And, and when I say tested, I mean tested to the point where, um, gosh, <laughs> it, you, you would be surprised how many hours we spend trying to break one of these rovers and trying to figure out where the extent of the rover is. I guess I should move to this side so you can see the rover in the background. Um, oh, okay. But, uh, I mean, we, we, we love uh, – these rovers become sort of like our children, and we want to nourish them. Um, but the, the trip for me from RPI uh, was awesome, and I'm, I'm so amazed that, you know, 26 years later uh, that I still get to work on these vehicles. I've, um, I've been blessed to be a part of all of the rover missions that have been to the surface. Um, they, uh, <laughs> I, say, I say this jokingly, but I was promoted to my level of incompetence. I was a section manager, which meant I had about 140 people on my team and uh, the, the team that I, I got to run uh, built, you know, the, the instruments and the helicopter for this particular vehicle. So uh, for Perseverance, um, there's a lot of ties that go back. And, and at one point in time, the whole, uh, I'll say in the mechanical world, in what we call the engineering and science directorate at JPL, the director of the engineering science directorate, the director or the, the, the manager of the uh, mechanical systems engineering, and then myself were all, uh, people who graduated from RPI. And so RPI has huge ties to this rover and every other rover, plus uh, a, a huge pipeline into JPL uh, that has been amazing for years. And um, I, I don't know what else to say other than, you know, this is going to be such a cool day. I'm very excited. Uh, it, it's just an amazing thing to get a chance to uh, be part of one of these rovers, listen to some of the science that's going to come back and, and some of the things that we're going to do with it. And then as we look toward the future with uh, what you just heard uh, in, in terms of a sample return, you, you can imagine how crazy uh, that engineering feat will be, not only just because of what we are trying to do getting to the surface, but then trying to get something from the surface back to Earth. It's just all these engineering challenges, and, and you can imagine the technology that has to be developed to make those happen, are, are still in front of us. And um, it, it's what excites me about doing this kind of work. Kobe, thank you so much. I'm so excited. You know, we live on this campus and we think, why not change the world? And then we have people like you and you're like, well, I'm going to change the world and then go to another one. Uh, it just, it really doesn't get much better than that. That is super cool. As an aside, you know, I, I work on vehicles that go to the bottom of the ocean and I thought those engineers were cool, but just, you just sort of blow my mind. That's, that's just so fantastic. So thank you for that. I don't know if there are any um, questions for Kobe real quick while we have him. I know he has to take off for the rest of the landing. I think we do. Go ahead, Jake. Yeah, we do. We do have one question uh, from Rhett that says, tell us about some of the difficulties of designing a helicopter for Mars um, and being so excited about this new toy. <laughs> yeah, so let, let, I, I guess, I mean, you know, uh, interesting to say there's a, there's a blog post uh, that's on the RPI site and, and Bob Ballaram, who was the chief engineer of the helicopters, another RPI grad. So I'll just keep pointing out these RPI people that are that are working on these things. but. Um, you know, the, the helicopter was crazy. Um, you know, uh, I can tell you all the, the stories and in and outs, but I'll, I'll talk about just, you know, thinking about flying something in a, in a we'll say, average 7 tour CO2. We can get down to a little bit less than that. And so you're talking 1 100th of our atmosphere and then being able to control it. Um, and the reality is, is that you can make really big propellers, uh, blades, and, and we teamed up with AV uh, to do that. Um, and they were an unbelievable industrial partner to, to work with us. Uh, but, you know, just making something light enough, uh, something that can sort of charge itself. I mean, like, you know, if, if you've read up on the helicopter in ingenuity, um, you'll find that, you know, it's not supposed to last for forever, right? It's not going to, you know, it doesn't really have a uh, science goal, i.e. it has to do this. I mean, what we're really trying to do, just like we did with uh, Sojourner way back when, is prove out the technology for future exploration. Um, and if, if you've been watching what's going on with the NASA, there's a, a, another mission that's going to go to Titan called Dragonfly, which is a quadcopter, uh, and, and, you know, that's been selected. Uh, Zibby Tuttle is the, is the PI, um, and that's done uh, out of uh, the applied physics laboratory. So, I mean, you're seeing this 
sort of new technology and way of uh, exploration becoming sort of the next thing, right? Can we do a mobility system that flies, covers a lot more land, sees the, the Earth or the, the Mars or Titan from a different perspective, um, and then can work in conjunction, at least for, for ingenuity, can work in conjunction with Perseverance, give us some information, maybe tell us what's over that ledge and is it, is it more important to go there versus going somewhere else. Now, we still have assets over the surface of Mars with Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, so we get very, very good imagery of the surface. But all of these things can actually help us um, as, as we go forward. So for me, it's really exciting because it's the next chapter in terms of exploration, right? This is our fifth rover on the surface. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to say it's old hat because it's not what you're going to see today is, is one of the craziest things that will happen. But um, in terms of growth, and moving forward with how we do exploration of other planetary bodies, this might be the next step. As Perseverance approached the surface of Mars, the virtual watch party pulled up NASA's live feed. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance, take place on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. While waiting for Perseverance to send back the first images of Mars, the scientists took some questions from the audience. We'll hear them read by Jacob Shelley, a professor of chemistry at Rensselaer, and answered by Brian Heenick, a Mars planetary scientist from the University of Colorado Boulder, astrobiologist Andrew Steele, a member of the NASA Sample Analysis at Mars team from the Carnegie Institution for Science, and of course, Professor Rogers. We'll start with Heenick answering a question about how the Mars rover team works. There are hundreds of scientists, literally, on this uh, rover team because every instrument has its own set of people. There are, uh, you know, people that are participating scientists, and everyone does a lot of jobs, just like we heard in the video earlier. Uh, the scientists, just like the engineers, do a lot of different jobs, uh, and they change through time. So some will be on the short-term plan, like what are we doing the next day based on the data we got back today? And others are sort of on the long team plan of, okay, in six months, we want to be here. So what are the most interesting things along that path? And so, yeah, there are all these levels of uh, time commitments and, and what the rover is going to do short versus long versus mid. There's all the instrument teams that are, you know, just trying to figure out if their instruments are turning on and, and working the way that they're supposed to like Steely. So yeah, there's a whole lot of roles uh, involved with this from here on out. I just, can I just ask you, Brian, um, that's a sort of a schooling team, right? Um, so there are some folks on the team sort of now, and they sort of roll off and new ones roll on. Isn't that right? As the course of the next 687 days goes? Uh, for this nominal mission, uh, I think the team that's in place stays to be the team in place. But then, then there will be new calls to have new people added on and, you know, I don't want to say this, but they want to get rid of the people that aren't really helping <laughs> participating like they're supposed to. <laughs> so they kick some people off or they have to repropose at least. And I uh, would like to add new blood throughout the mission. And even though it's a nominal one Mars year mission, uh, just like Curiosity was one and a half Mars years, I think, but it's it's gone 10 Earth years already. So um, we expect this will uh, be a long lived mission has plenty of power to continue to drive itself and power the instruments for a decade, I would say, it would be a, a, probably a, a good estimate of how long this would survive on Mars based on the past uh, over-engineered rovers. Once they get there, they do far better than uh, what the engineers promise. They, they like to have their margins, but <laughs> these things live for a long time, hopefully. Yeah, Brian, we, we also, that's great. We have another question for you. Uh, all right. Basically, how can how do we determine whether a uh, a part on this crater is an inlet or an outlet uh, from a previous time? Uh, yeah, good question. Well, we have good topographic maps of Mars, so good elevation data for Mars, so we can see which side is the uphill side, which side is the downhill side, and also just by looking at the way the river networks are coalescing, you can tell which way is uh, the downhill direction. But yeah, good question. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see, I have uh, a question that's probably geared more for Karen, I think. 
uh, actually probably for everybody, um, is there a protocol set up that if by chance, maybe not in this mission, because this mission is mainly focused on ancient life, um, but in a future mission, is there a protocol set up if we do find microbial life on Mars or on some other planetary body? So I, I will start this this answer really quickly, and then I um, I will I will give Steely warning that I'm going to pass it over to him in just a second. Uh, NASA for decades now has had what we call a planetary protection officer. The planetary protection officer um, at NASA has two main jobs. Um, one of them is to make sure that when we send spacecraft uh, elsewhere, we send sterile spacecraft, and we are not bringing terrestrial microbes or Earth microbes. Um, anywhere else um, in the solar system. And so that is that is one of the planetary protection officer's main jobs. The second job, though, of the planetary protection officer is really going to sort of come um, in, into sort of much higher sort of prominence um, in the next decade as we think about sample return, right? Because uh, whether we can detect sort of extant or modern life on Mars, um, whether we detect it or not, during Mars sample return, um, we are very concerned that whatever comes back, if there's something there that we don't even recognize as life, we are very careful um, about uh, bringing that back in a, in a safe way, right? So we are gonna return samples um, from Mars within hopefully the next decade. Uh, the planetary protection officer is a big part of trying to make sure that those samples come back and we don't essentially contaminate our own planet. Um, with with Martian life, and so that that plays a big part in the design and specificity of this Mars sample return handling facility. And so I imagine Steely has a little bit more information about the Mars um, sample handling return facility. And Steely, can you jump in and, and tell us a little bit about that? Well, at the moment, the, the you know plans are, are well underway with the international groups. Uh, talking about where it's going to uh, host the samples. Obviously in the US, uh, JSC, uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston has uh, the capability and the expertise to do so. It hold, holds all of the um, astro materials uh, that have been collected over the years, Apollo, Stardust, uh, Osiris-Rex team. Uh, so um, basically they'll put together a, a center that uh, will receive the, uh, the samples from Mars initially. So uh, part of the planetary protection chain here is I think will break the chain to ensure that no uh, Martian dust or materials can contaminate the Earth on the way back, uh, just in case there are uh, live organisms that we haven't been able to detect in the mission. Um, at that point, it will go into the receiving facility and be aseptically handled. Uh, it's really interesting if you think about things like Ebola, uh, these really nasty viruses that um, that people work in laboratories on. That's called a biosafety level for uh, laboratory. We actually have to be safer than that. We have to be at, at what is notionally biosafety level five because biosafety level four uh, facilities are quite, uh, they're not worried about contaminating the virus. And, and so we, we're quite concerned about making sure everything's clean for the sample so we can ensure that whatever sample we're looking at is absolutely pristine, that we're looking at the signal from uh, Mars. Uh, in that sample and not filling ourselves with bacteria that we've put there or, or compounds or chemicals that we've introduced to in those samples that may mask uh, an organism like that. And so all of the initial investigations will go through that first. And, uh, and after the, uh, if there is no life or if those samples are, are proven to the satisfaction of you know, the scientists uh, and uh, working on that and also the, the government entities concerned with that, uh, then those samples will be uh, released like the Apollo samples are now. Um, the, the interesting fact about looking for um, Martian life is obviously you have to uh, kind of be a bit smarter about whether or not the life you're looking for is like terrestrial life. So there's a lot of scientific hoops to jump through as far as recognizing the Martian life form over terrestrial life form. Um, people like myself and people on the team have been thinking about that for, for, for a very long time and, and how you do that and execute that to ensure that uh, you know we keep Mars safe from us as uh, safe from us. Great, thanks Steely. Uh, we have a, a really nice question here for, for Karen and for all of the, the panel. Um, 
if I can find it, that would be helpful, huh? Uh, <laughs> Uh, since there's not really any degrees in astrobiology, can you explain the process of becoming an astrobiologist or getting involved with research on campus and in industry in this area? I, I would be happy to start that and open that question up to anyone here. Um, so first of all, actually, if you're an undergraduate here at uh, RPI, you can get a minor in astrobiology. So please reach out to us. Um, you can find us on the website. Uh, you, you can find me. Well, you can't really find me here because we're really not on campus, but you, you can find me. Um, we, we have an undergraduate program, at least a minor program in astrobiology. Uh, but one, one of the things I like to say about astrobiology is that it is, it is a discipline that requires you to have both breadth and depth, right? You have to be an expert in something, right? It might be an expert in geology or an expert in astro physics, um, you might be an extra an expert in organic chemistry and and you need that um, to study things like the organic chemistry we might find on Mars. You might be an, an expert in analytical chemistry like we saw from um, Mike Engel and our very own Jake Shelley, right? These are folks who have spent decades becoming the, the very best of their field and knowing sort of everything there is to know about that field. But you can't actually apply any of that expertise unless you can then take that expertise and understand the entire breadth of, of the astrobiology field, which includes everything from the origins of life on Earth to looking for exoplanets beyond our own solar system. It includes everything in between. And so astrobiology, to me, one of the reasons I, I sort of moved from I, I was, I, I was, I came up as an expert in geochemistry and extreme microbiology, and I still am. Um, but I, I really moved into astrobiology because I love the breadth of understanding um, the chemistry of, of Mars and the climate of Mars and what's going on on Titan and how we look for exoplanets and trying to apply the geochemistry I know about the Earth to other planets, other moons, and other solar system bodies. And so being an astrobiologist is one of those things where you need to be a disciplinary specialist. So you're probably also a chemist or a geologist or a biologist or a physicist or, or something, right? You are a disciplinary specialist, and then you are also a multidisciplinary or what I think we often term sort of a transdisciplinary specialist, right? You develop the abilities to take your disciplinary expertise and apply them sort of across this very, very broad discipline. And so there is a, there is a minor here at, at RPI in astrobiology. Um, there, there aren't that many places though around the country that, that really have a program in astrobiology. And, and I think one of the reasons we have a minor and not a major is because we want our students in astrobiology to also major um, in a, in a very specific discipline so they can develop that disciplinary expertise. And so, so that, that's sort of what I, what I think about astrobiology. You need to, you need to sort of be both of those things. You can hear more from Karen Rogers about the Rare Center on episode four of season two of this podcast. Please take a moment to rate the podcast on whatever app you're on. And if you'd like to learn more about what's happening at Rensselaer, visit RPI. Dot edu. Thanks for listening.